Uh, so this, this event really is the sort of kickoff event for the Corbett Center's Strategic Thinker series. Um, we are hoping that eventually sort of every six months we will have one of these roundtables to discuss a major maritime thinker. And sort of once we move through some of the major maritime thinkers, we might start going to more unusual or not so often considered maritime thinkers. And the purpose of this series is really for, for students who are in PME, for students who are in undergraduate, master's, PhD, but with an interest in maritime affairs, um, or for anyone who's really just interested in strategic thinking and how strategic thinking is, is happening today um, within the world of defense here and now. So for our first series, we are doing Corbett, as you all know, and we have with us Professor Andrew Landert, Professor Jake Beaton, and uh, Dr. David Morgan Owen, um, and of course myself. And we are just going to have a sort of informal but led discussion about Corbett as a historian, Corbett as a strategic thinker, um, and sort of Corbett just as, as an Edwardian man running through the world and, and you know, trying to gift his ideas to further national strategy. So without further ado, I will actually hand over to Dr. David Morgan Owen, who is the chair for this session. Thanks, Anna, uh, and welcome everyone. For the eagle eyed amongst you who tuned in expecting Greg Kennedy, I am not Greg Kennedy. I apologize for this. If Greg is why you are here, uh, and I can't imagine why that would be the case, then I am sorry. But I have stepped in at last minute to do my best impersonation of Greg in, in chairing this. I'm very pleased. Uh, pleased to be here uh, amongst such august company, uh, both in the participants and, and on the panel. Um, so I'm just going to offer a, a very, very brief uh, introduction before we then kind of move through 45 minutes, as Anna said, of, of sort of semi-guided but informal discussion amongst the, the panellists who are going to kind of share some of their um, expertise and ideas. And then we're going to open it to the floor as much as possible. So if you want to type any questions or comments into the chat, we'll all do our best to monitor that as we go through. Um, and then we'll certainly come back and pick up some of those um, questions at the end. So very briefly then, um, I think we've got a really great blend in the panel here because we're going to approach Corbett from a series of different traditions that are each going to bring a lot to illuminating uh, a really rich and fascinating subject. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Anna Brinkman Schwartz, who introduced the session, is uh, a rising star of, of 17th and 18th century um, diplomatic, imperial um, and, and maritime history, uh, working particularly on, uh, on Britain, but also in a, in a broader Atlantic and Anglo-Iberian uh, context. So has encountered very much Corbett the historian, um, some of those really uh, enduring and influential books on the Seven Years' War uh, and afterwards. Um, next, we have Jake Wyden, who uh, probably must be about 10 years ago now that Jake's original Corbett book came out, which is now available in paperback, as I discovered today, for a very reasonable price. Um, so Jake obviously brings uh, comes to this topic very much from the perspective of, of military thought and strategic theory and Corbett's kind of place within the broader canon of thinking about war uh, uh, in, in the round and, um, and how Corbett has kind of influenced how we've conceptualized maritime strategy and war in, in the maritime domain over the course of the last of the last hundred years. And in this context, obviously, Professor Andrew Lambert needs, needs no introduction. Uh, Andrew's biography of Corbett came out this year, his much anticipated biography, um, which I whistled through over the last week and can thoroughly recommend to all of you. It's a fantastic book and in which Andrew has advanced a number of, of really significant and original arguments about Corbett, the thinker, the historian, and the man, which I'm sure we're gonna get into um, during the course of, of some of this discussion. So that's more than enough um, from me. What I'd like to do to start us off is to maybe um, ask each of you perhaps to elaborate a little bit on your own kind of perspective and relationship with Corbett and Corbett's work and how you feel that he's kind of um, particularly relevant or significant to your own research or indeed uh, your, your teaching if, you're, if that's something that you'd like to reflect on as well. So perhaps um, if, if we'd like to kick off with Anna and then um, feel free to, to, to jump in in whichever order you like. Great, thanks Dave. Um, so yeah, so, so my interactions with Corbett actually began through Andrew um, as one of his MA students in the, the History of Warfare MA offered at King's. Um, and my, you know, I sort of, I fell in love with Corbett's writing uh, probably because as, as any of you who've read 
Andrew's recent book will know, Corbett actually started off in a very literary way um, and was a novelist as well. And so his, his writing is, is incredibly accessible and compelling. And as an introduction to sort of maritime strategic thinking and, and the maritime world, uh, you couldn't really ask for anything better to hook you in and get you really interested in the subject. Um, I, I then pursued my interest in Corbett um, because I realized, or you know, Andrew pointed out to me at, at one point that he in fact had written the Seven Years' War book, um, which he is rightly famous for. And this is, this is the book that really launched my interest in the Seven Years' War and in the Seven Years' War as, a, as an example of sort of quintessentially British maritime strategic thinking. Um, and, and in a wider context, sort of quintessential maritime thought in an Atlantic world in a very 18th or long 18th century context that applies up through the Napoleonic period and, and too much before. So I very much approach Corbett as a historian and as for myself as a historian of strategic thinking, um, I find I find his his interactions between being a lawyer, being a historian, and being a practitioner and, and a strategic thinker, uh, a, a really fruitful avenue for my own thinking. Um, and I, I think the last thing that I would say on this is that I actually, I find Corbett rather inspirational as someone involved in PME. So the, the way that Corbett writes is incredibly accessible. And I find that as someone who, who is also teaching in PME, to make my own subjects and any subjects that we cover and teach accessible to the students and to get them interested in it and to get them to have the same sort of passion that I have for the subject is probably one of the best things that I can impart upon them. And whilst I have learned this from various colleagues and various of my own teachers, I actually think that it is, it is Corbett who first really drove this point home to me um, from his own approach to PME. Um, so yeah, I would, that, that would be me for that first one. All right. Um, thank you for inviting me to this roundtable. Um, uh, I um, first encountered uh, Corbett in 2003. Uh, it's a, a bit of an interesting background. Uh, the Swedish armed forces were writing doctrines and they thought of having a sort of a textbook on military theory as well. And, and some officers started to write that book and they realized pretty soon that it wasn't very good. Uh, and it was diverging between the different services. And so they brought in two young researchers, me and uh, um, a, a colleague of mine, Jan Ongström, to write this textbook on military theory, sort of a primer on military theory, to go along with all these service doctrines and the operational doctrine. Uh, so I got hired for that. Uh, and um, uh, I wrote the naval part of that book, or the naval chapter, and that was actually the first time. I've seen his name before, but I never um, read him. Uh, and uh, my background is in the history, Cold War history, uh, a bit of a political scientist as well. Uh, and we were trying to write, you know, this, this book on, on, on military theory, and uh, immediately uh, I read through uh, works on, on naval theory, uh, maritime strategy, and uh, Corbett caught my eye as, uh, you know, a very sharp mind uh, and a very good book. I mean, it's old, uh, but it still was very easy to read, uh, very well put together, very convincing arguments. Uh, so after that book was published, uh, eventually, it came into a, a, an English translation in 2015 uh, as Contemporary Military Theory, published by Rutledge. Uh, but after uh, the work was done in, let's say, 2005, I started to think, OK, what should I write my next book on? And then I was very excited by Corbett and his work. So I decided to write a, sort of a theoretical, intellectual biography uh, of, of Corbett. And the only book available at that time was uh, Donald Shorman's uh, uh, biography that I thought that, you know, I could write a different sort of book than he, he did. 
and and consider the fact that I'm not much of a naval historian. So I came to Corbett from a military theoretical perspective, having read a lot of Clausewitz, Yomini, Little Hart, um, Machiavelli, uh, and thinkers like that, even mo modern ones. Uh, so I tried to write a, that kind of book. Uh, and um, I much regret now that I didn't have Andrew's new book at hand uh, for the historical context when I wrote that book. It would have been so helpful for me because I never had the time and I don't think I have the skill to, to get into British naval history uh, to get the, the, the context I needed. So I just approached it as, as theory. And that's what I tried to do in my, in, in my book and not do a mess of him just because I didn't know the historical con uh, context. But um, uh, hopefully I, I, I managed to avoid the worst excesses of you know, treating this as theory and sort of draw it from the, from the historical context. Uh, and, um, but I'm very glad that uh, Andrew has, has, uh, has written his book now. I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot by reading it uh, about Corbett. Uh, so thank you, Andrew, for, for your book. Uh, it was something I started a very long time ago, and um, Jake's book was one of the road, one of the way stations on the road, realizing that other people were actually engaging with Corbett and, and had different things to say. You know, I, I very much didn't want to write another version of Jake's book. I, this was the book that I was always going to write. Um, my relationship with Corbett started when I joined the War Studies Department in 1978 as an MA student. And I worked with Professor Brian Ranft, who had edited and published the first post-war edition of Some Principles of Maritime Strategy, only four years before that, for the use of the Royal Navy. So I realized from the very start that this was a text which had a very deliberate focus on a PME context. Uh, later in my career, I ended up teaching at the, at the Naval Staff College before it, it wound up, and also at the, the British Army Academy uh, at Santa. So I, I had ample experience of PME to see the issues that Corbett was dealing with. Uh, part of the value of his elegant and, and accessible prose, he is not talking to historians who are working through difficult subjects. He's talking to career professionals whose primary task is not to understand the theory of war. It's actually to be junior and, and mid-ranking officers and carry out a rather more mundane set of tasks. Uh, and that this is a shaping um, education that becomes more significant. So Corbett isn't teaching initial officer training. He's teaching on the Navy's war course. He's teaching commanders, captains, and admirals. And that is his audience. So while he writes about history, he is conscious of the uniformed, present-minded uh, nature of that audience. So for him, history isn't the end product. History is the vehicle that leads towards those conclusions, which are in some principles. His book on the Seven Years' War, in many ways, is a, is a template of what British strategy looks like in 1907. If you cross out France and write in Germany and cross out Ship of the Line and write Dreadnought, you've pretty much got what the British think war is going to look like in 1907. So it, it, it's a period piece. It's a 1907 account of a war fought 200 odd years earlier, uh, written for people who are thinking about doing something pretty similar in the future. And Corbett's audience always has that mix, but he made a huge effort, particularly in the last 10, 14 years of his life, to make sure that the history he was de delivering and the history of armies, navies, and war that he was engaged with was taken seriously by the academic historical community, because that was the only way that it would be taken seriously by the military education community. If this is serious, or in the Edwardian terms, scientific, then it's something the military needs, and the military will buy science. If you tell them it's impressionistic and, and somewhat um, 
uh, wrapped up in the minutiae of the past, then really not going to be very concerned with it. So Corbett is creating a credible history. He's linking it with the leading movements in international as well as British history. You know, 1913, the world of history, of history comes to London and Corbett delivers his own standout um, section to the Congress of Historical Sciences on naval and military history. Uh, for the first time, naval and military history gets respectable in 1913, and it's Corbett that makes that happen. He also makes sure that the, 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 uh, the lectures are chaired by very senior figures from the Royal Navy and the British Army uh, by holding them in the United Services Institute, which is literally across the road from the War Office and the Admiralty. Uh, so we have the first sea lord chairing most of the naval history papers. Uh, this is Corbett drawing the Navy into thinking seriously and using the past as precedent. And throughout my career, I've, I've seen the parallels between those of us who, who are working in that context and the experience that Corbett had. Uh, I have to say, in, in the defense of the rest of us, Corbett doesn't have to do this. He doesn't need in the work. He is very well off. Um, he could have stopped working at any stage in his life and it wouldn't have troubled him at all. He does this because he believes that it's important and he believes that it's his duty uh, as an educated member of the, of the upper middle classes to make a contribution. And this is the contribution that he wants to make. So he's driven by a sense of responsibility, not by the, the more mundane financial pressures that, that affect many people in this line of work. Um, I also, because I work at King's, became increasingly interested in his great friend, Sir John Lawton, the pioneer naval historian who, who really kicked a lot of this off, who inspired both Corbett and Mahan with his work. So 20 years ago, I published a, a study of, of Lawton's career. And I very much saw that as the, the opening shot in a, in a two-part offensive to get this, this subject of naval history put on a proper basis and to see where it sits at, at the intersection of military education, strategic thought, and academic history. It's never belonged wholly in any one of those communities. It's always drawn strength from all of them. And different practitioners take different cuts of this. So Mahan uses history as a resource which he chops bits out of and, and assembles them into, into theory. Uh, Lawton insists on doing history and doesn't do much theorizing at all and is somewhat critical of theoretical writing. Uh, and Corbett, I think, hits the sweet spot and manages to, to meld the two together in a way that is most effective, both for the educational purpose and also using strategic theory as an analytical tool in the writing of military naval history. So Corbett, I think, brings these developments to a point where they're stretching across the education of officers uh, and the civilian sector, where they're reaching civilian audiences, but also having an impact uh, on the military. And his role in the First World War just emphasizes how important that clarity of thought, that ability to express himself so elegantly and efficiently at a time when words are often spewed out onto paper. Corbett always produces a neat uh, concise and effective memorandum. So he has transferable skills as well as uh, his educational role. And of course, his practice as a lawyer means that advocacy, which is much what much of his writing is, is second nature. Making an argument, developing an argument, engaging in argument is a key part of Corbett's intellectual rationale. I've actually got a book on, on the shelf here that he owned. And in the margins, I can see him writing part of his book about Trafalgar. He's actually critiquing the essay in this book, and he's using that. And you can see his Trafalgar book emerging in the margins of this text. So he enjoys the debate. He enjoys the argument. He doesn't see that as a fixed and closed process. It's an open process. And the biggest thing he wanted his students to take away from what, all of his work it's not finished. It's not closed. There's a debate. It's ongoing. It's a permanent process. PME is not about teaching people something. It's about teaching them to think. And Corbett absolutely nailed that down. His last essay in the Naval Review was a wonderful piece where he argues that naval officers really need to think about how they should think. Then they can start thinking about their subject. They need to get the mechanics right 
before they approach the discipline of being um, educated naval officers. Uh, and he takes them through what the problems of thinking inductively and deductively are uh, and suggesting that they really ought to get that right before they start to address the material they're dealing with. So it's it's been a very long time and I've enjoyed the journey and I, I can even read Corbett's handwriting, which is not something many people can say. I remember the, after the first time you, you were talking to me about the Corbett diary, I obviously hurried over there and had a look at it. I was like, may as well be in a different language. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that point about how, how Corbett kind of so intuitively and beguilingly gets how to write in a very accessible, thought-provoking way for the military audience is, is, a, is something that has endured incredibly well. Like wh when, you, when students um, engage with even the Green Pamphlet or sections of some principles, they always come away shocked that they found something that made them really think about something differently. And that's a, an incredible, uh, I mean, ima imagine how pleased any of us would be if something that we wrote a hundred years hence would still be speaking to people in a way that was, that was kind of encouraging them to do that. So we've got, um, there's a question in the chat that I'm gonna come back to in a moment that's about um, kind of more contemporary questions. But before we get to kind of Corbett's um, more enduring um, legacy or what he might tell us about kind of today, just maybe wanna say, um, ask you for your views a little bit about kind of how how we might appreciate Corbett or how we might approach Corbett in terms of his kind of um we, we've spoken about him as as an astute historian he's also someone that speaks very powerfully into in, strategic studies and also to, to kind of PME contexts so maybe I would pose the question then of how do you think in your research you've encountered different disciplines and traditions of thought treating Corbett and what place does he kind of hold in those sorts of um, different disciplines in, 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 in your analysis? I know that you've written directly about kind of Corbett and, and maritime doctrine, Jake, but kind of it, how, how do you analyse kind of how people have engaged with his work, what they've taken away from it, the things that they've maybe questioned or not understood or misrepresented or really seized on? Mm -hmm. I I think they they actually I mean he's he's writing his writing is so accessible uh, that it's it's compared to other theorists I think he's he, he's harder to mis uh, misunderstand uh, while other theorists are pretty easy to 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 get wrong and and misinterpret um, I mean I I know. Uh, even today at the senior military uh, program uh, at, uh, in the Swedish Defense College, they read Corbett and they read Mahan in original text. And uh, like Andrew said, you know, the first pages there in, in that famous book by, by Mahan from 1890, okay, that's fairly accessible, uh, but, but uh, it seems Corbett has such a modern style, style, uh, and it's easy to 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 understand it. And he's very clear in his prose, uh, prose. He's he his con conceptual clarity. Uh, it just holds the reader in 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 his hand, and just you go th you go through the book, uh, and. Um, uh, well, I I, uh, I I think that's that's probably part of his his attraction, that he's so accessible, but at the same time, very precise, very condensed, and you get a lot of rewards for 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 reading uh, that text. Could be 50, 100 pages, but you get a lot uh, of of knowledge by reading just 50, 100 pages in that book, uh, compared to many many other theorists that you need to read and assess for a long time to sort of, okay, what do they mean? Uh, what's, what's their approach? Uh, so I, I think that's the, the important thing or, or, or what makes Corbett uh, attractive. And it's, it's fairly amazing actually that, that more than hundred years later, uh, it feels so modern and so uh, current 
and and um, usable for even the contemporary uh, naval officer. Uh, I, I get feedback a lot from my students, senior naval officers and, and, and cadets, and, and they are very, you know, Corbett is, is their favorite. Mm. I think it's, so uh, again, coming from a sort of empire history perspective, I, I find it really interesting that, you know, in the past, I'd say 10, 15 years, even in the past five years, the history of empire and, and the history of the Atlantic world and even the conception of the Atlantic world as its own sort of subfield of history has, has really come a long way um, and it has really, really developed. And as such, I think often treatments like Corbett's sort of get left behind and you will often, often encounter the very sort of modern historian dismissal of Corbett because, oh, it was written in 1907. So it couldn't, it couldn't possibly still be relevant to histories of empire or histories of the Atlantic world. And I think that that is, is kind of missing the point. And I, I would suggest that one of the things that Corbett perhaps does the best in his, particularly in his book on the Seven Years' War, is actually analyze the political situation and analyze the relationship between the politicians, the legal circles, and the admirals and the practitioners. And th this relationship has never gone away, right? This, this is a key relationship for any conflict that you are studying or any sort of security situation or empire situation. And hmm. Corbett kind of makes that, that argument probably the most elegantly um, of, of any historian I have ever read. And he really drives it home that the success of a national strategy or the success of an operation is often down to the relationships of the individual people involved. So whilst you can have a doctrine, whilst you can have you know, a pamphlet that gives you the ideas behind a national strategy, if you don't have the relationships that make that strategy then work or make that thinking then work and actually play out correctly, um, it, it won't necessarily come off. And certainly in, in, in a PME context, being able to sort of convey to students that are analyzing these relationships and then analyzing their own relationships when they are in positions of command is really key to seeing a successful strategy or operation play out is, is perhaps one of his more sort of enduring commentaries. And it is now often missed out in histories of the Seven Years' War or histories of empire with notable exceptions, of course. Yeah. That's a really su super important point about, about the form of it. So yeah. there's, there's sort of a, there's an intuitive sort of it, seem, it seems to make no sense that 100 plus years ago, it was possible to write what you might call strategic history in a thoroughly considered short form accessible way, but in a way that is not really encouraged by the, his, the, 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 the pressures within the discipline of history today. So writing a an accessible 100 page distillation of the strategy of war x or just of war x is not something that's commonly done i mean like what a, a very rare recent example would be michael howard's very short introduction to the first world war because that's a forty thousand word book on the first world war now when you compare that to the hundreds of thousands of books not alone hundreds of thousands of words that are written on that war and if you want to write about it you have to cross so many I's, dot so many T's, there were so many issues that it's actually almost impossible to write this sort of a book, or it's very difficult to, to write this sort of a book. Um, I think as well, so one of, sorry, it's just what you said reminded me of this, and I, I think this is an important point to make here. What Corbett is doing, if you're not paying attention, can really start seeming like you are arguing for great man theory or great man history. And it's, it's important to make the distinction that that is absolutely not what's going on because it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter particularly who is in the position of, you know, prime minister or who is in the position of first lord of the admiralty. What matters is their relationship. So it's not that he's arguing that, you know, Pitt was the, was, if it wasn't William Pitt, it couldn't have been anyone else. Although there may be some merit to that because William Pitt is an exceptional man. But what matters here is his relationship to Lord Anson and his relationship to Lord Hardwick, who is the chancellor, and his relationship to Newcastle. So it, it, it's the relationship between 
the people in power, not an inherent importance of those people by themselves. Yep. And I think that distinction is really important in order to continue to give Corbett his due and to use him in a historical discipline where the great man theory for very good reasons is, is passe. Yeah. I think, you know, there's a, a couple of very good points developing on those arguments. Um, Corbett got his knighthood for writing a cabinet memorandum on the conduct of cabinet government in wartime. It was written for Asquith. Uh, it was later used by Lloyd George. Uh, that's what he got his, his knighthood for, not for a lifetime of service or his dedication to PME, the writing of history, any of those things. It was a get out of jail card for a government in trouble. His understanding of politics is at a very high level. His brother is a member of parliament. He is a lifelong, indeed, a, a dynastic liberal on the progressive side of the Liberal Party. Uh, on at least three occasions, he was invited to stand for Parliament. Um, two of those were safe seats. Um, his views of empire, going back to the point Anna was raising, he's not a died in the wool defend the empire. He believes in the future being a commonwealth, a commonwealth linked by mutual dependence on the sea, a commonwealth of freestanding nations with shared culture and, and shared interests. Uh, he is not like his contemporary Churchill, for example, thinking about saving everything, he's looking for a developing progressive future. So his strategy is not about defending what we have, it's about overseeing the evolution of this important organization into something which is different. Uh, and I think that marks him out from so many strategic thinkers who tend to be both uniformed and socially conservative. Mahan certainly fits that, uh, that model. Um, Clausewitz, by contrast, of course, for a Prussian army officer, is a, a liberal, and that may be part of the, the synergy. Um, Michael Howard um, obviously springs to mind. Um, the reason I looked at the British way of war in this book, as well as at Corbett's work, um, not just because Corbett co actually coined the phrase in 1917, um, but also because of the way that in Michael Howard's great book on the Continental Commitment, um, he doesn't engage with Corbett at all. Um, so Michael didn't use Corbett. He didn't consult Corbett. He, he used a straw man to make his alternative to the Continental Commitment, which was the journalistic output of Basil Little Hart, um, who was spoon-fed a kind of bowdlerized version of Corbett by Herbert Richmond in the 1930s, uh, which is the basis of his writing on a, a British way of war. Um, you know, it's one of the problems with Michael Howard's book that he is very much writing about the continental commitment of the early 1970s, uh, but he's going back in history to stitch together a, a narrative that sustains this as an obvious and logical thing to do, when, it, in all honesty, it has to be seen as, as entirely asymmetric to Britain's interests uh, and unprecedented in terms of a standing commitment. So, the accessibility of Corbett doesn't ensure that everybody reads him. Those who don't want to read him don't read him. Uh, the last book on the British way of war, my good friend David French's book, um, manages to mention him, I think, twice. Um, uh, and on neither occasion of, is he in any way seriously engaged with what Corbett is talking about, which is national strategy. Corbett's maritime strategy is not what navies do. It is what the nation does in a country like Britain which is a sea power uh, and sees the world in global and maritime terms. You know, that's why it doesn't translate into most continental languages because it's not relevant to most continental powers who, who have a navy for a, a more limited range of, of tasks and find Mahan's arguments more effective because Mahan is also talking to a continental military power. Uh, so he, trans he would translate well into many languages, but he has not been translated because his message is not one uh, that works across uh, all of those divisions. Um, for me, his greatest kind of intellectual contribution is to make people reading in English understand that Clausewitz is not a monolith, but a piece of work that has to be developed both in time and in context. You know, reading Clausewitz is very good. Reading Clausewitz, as Corbett does, in the 1900s in England, uh, at a time when England, Britain is a great power, but a maritime power, you come up with some principles. It's that meeting of the historical 
record the analytical tools. And he, as he is the greatest Clausewitzian, I think, of the 20th century because he doesn't take Clausewitz as gospel. He takes him as the basis for fresh and original thinking to reflect the particular circumstances in which he and his audience happen to find themselves. He gets the key from another German author, Rudolf von Kammerer, German general who, who wrote about Clausewitz and said, the great thing about Clausewitz, unlike Jomini and all the other strategic systems, is this is capable of being developed. Kammerer developed it for Germany, and Corbett developed it, and it's a much bigger leap uh, for Imperial Maritime Britain. And that, I think, is you know, a hugely impressive piece of work, um, which I think puts him at the very top end of the, the Clausewitzians of the 20th century. That's a really, that's a really interesting point, Andrew, and uh, I think quite a neat way of maybe segueing the discussion a bit more towards kind of the legacy and, and contemporary relevance of, of some of this. So perhaps as a sort of first step in that direction, I might pose a question about kind of how we, how we collectively, we and broadly um, academics and practitioners should or can approach Corbett as a text. So I think the, the analogy with Clausewitz is, is, is a good one here, right? So whenever, whenever a serious debate about Clausewitz brews up, you, you, questions are asked about which translation you are reading, about whether you're reading it in the original German, about whether a particular section of the book was finished or was subsequently changed or would it have been developed. I think it's fair to say that, that no equivalent debate exists for Corbett or certainly nowhere near on, on a similar sort of scale. Yeah, I'm trying. So, I, I am trying to start one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could. I maybe we'll, 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 you know, progress it, progress it here. So perhaps the first question then is about kind of um, maybe about treatment and about um, the how we can ex how we can continue to develop some of Corbett's ideas. How maybe that process might enable us to move past some of the kind of very specific cultural context in which Corbett was writing, or indeed what the limitations of that. Um, kind of approach might be. So does anyone want to kick us off on on treatments of Corbett? Um, I'll, I'll jump in just because actually this is something I've been I've been thinking about. Um, and actually, funny enough, I've been thinking about this since I read Hugh Strawn's biography of On War um, and thinking about how biographies of particular books are actually useful, uh, particularly for you know, as you say, students who are involved in PME or, or current practitioners who just wish to have a sort of deeper understanding of these theories. And I think, you know, and, and Andrew's book is a perfect example of this as well, but contextualizing the theorists that we ask students to engage with is really important. And I think we often don't do it in a PME context, in part because we either think, well, they don't have time because they've got so much else on to do, or we think, well, we can't do that because, you know, they're they're not academics, they're, they're not historians, they're not interested in these background contexts. And I, I genuinely think that we're actually doing them a disservice in this case, because it wouldn't take that much more time or that much more effort to involve our students in this contextualization. And I think it would deeply enrich their interactions with the theorists and deepen their understanding as well. So I think that that's that is partly on us to to push this movement that, that I think both Andrew and Hugh Strawn already recognize and to actually have more faith in our students and in in their intellectual curiosity. And I think that 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 would really bear fruit if if we take PME in that direction moving forward. Um, but that maybe that's just a pipe dream. I'm not I'm not sure what, what Jake and Andrew would think about that. I'm happy to take that on. I uh, I agree entirely with that. Um, I did write a a publication history of of some of Corbett's books as a way of working out. Um, you know, you have to know with some principles that Corbett drafted it at the behest of Jackie Fisher, who sent him an elegant notebook to write it in, uh, which Corbett didn't use. It's still in his archive. Um, he then made sure that the first Sea Lord of the day read and approved it before he took it to his publisher to be published. So if the first Sea Lord has read and signed off on it, that sort of looks to me like Edwardian doctrine, um, which is pretty much what I, I would argue it is. Um, and then in the PME context, if you can get your students engaged, it is going to be by helping them to understand uh, 
just how human those writers are. So being tasked with the, the um, unlovely job of teaching Clausewitz to uh, army captains who are anxious to pass their promotion exams, I quickly realized the key was to make them understand that he was one of them and to take them through his military experience and to stress that he's not writing a book of theory, he's digesting his own hard-won experience. You know, you can't take Napoleon out of on war. You can't take the Russian campaign out of on war. You certainly can't take the battles of Jena and Auerstadt out of on war. That's what's driving that book. It's bitter personal experience. It's trying to reconcile the mythology of the Prussian army with the catastrophe that befell it in 1806. After that, they were much better engaged with Clausewitz. They understood who he was and they realized that they too had to think about their profession and that part of that thinking would be driven by their own experiences. And the last, it's a long time ago now, it's 30 years ago, but the last group of captains I, I taught in that way had just come back from the first Gulf War. Uh, and they had brought a lot of experience with them and, and they were digesting that experience as we were talking about these issues. So I think that's a very important point. We have stra strategic theory doesn't emerge written on tablets of stone by a deity. It's written by human beings. And the better we know them, the better we understand them uh, and the better we understand the context in which they're writing, uh, the more useful their ideas are. These are not unique godlike figures they are human all too human and knowing them makes their work much more interesting you need to know that alfred thayer mahan called his dog yomini um, and that tells you a great deal about his strategic thinking you also need to know that his father was uh, was yomini's high priest in north america um, and that tragically he had a mental aberration and committed suicide and this is why mahan never mentions his father in all of his writings his father published extensively uh, but Mahan never mentions that the influence is there but he's not prepared to talk about the unpleasant nature of, of the end of his father's life and very few people have picked up on that and it's the same with Corbett you need to know that he's been around the world that his close personal friends include half the liberal cabinet going into the first world war um, he he works with artists he works with musicians he, he's part of the london cultural scene he isn't working in an ivory tower or in some out of the way place he's at the heart of living breathing london he works in the committee of imperial defense which is a, a ramshackle old building underneath what is now the south end of um, the mod main building uh, he lives in knightsbridge and he walks to work through green park and he often meets uh, movers and shakers on his journeys to and from work. You know, this is a man at the very center of power and to see him as anything other than right engaged, not just in wartime, but also in peacetime at the very heart of the political system. His brother is an MP, you know, he's, he's one of the coefficients. He's right at the heart of this thing. And that absolutely shapes what he's thinking. It also shapes what he's thinking about because those conversations are raising the questions that he's then going on to answer. So he, he knows what the official world is thinking about, and he's managing to bring that into his thinking. So he's very much of a time. And the fact that he's remained relatively timeless uh, is a great credit to him and the quality of his work. I think as well, there's a lot, and so, sorry, Jake, I'll, I'll let you talk in a, in a second. Um, it just occurred to me that this, you know, there, there is there is a lot published out there and, and admittedly it is usually from a historical perspective, but, you know, when, when we think about the, the sort of people that we tend to study in PME or who perhaps we don't study and maybe we should, you know, books written about Lincoln and his relationship with his cabinet in the past couple of years have been extraordinarily good. Um, you know, the biography of, of Marie von Clausewitz uh, that came out a couple of years ago, again, really sheds light on, on the relationships that shaped Clausewitz thinking. And as you say, you know, the, you know the, the, the men and women that we're teaching in PME right now, a lot of them have just come back. And as you say, are digesting their own experiences of Iraq and Afghanistan. And they are undergoing similar intellectual transformations 
as Clauschwitz and, and we as civilian sort of educators are undergoing similar digestions as Corbett and his relationships. So I think to be able to study those relationships and convey that they are important in a strategic context and in a PME context um, is really important going forward because a lot of the research is out there. A lot of the material is out there. Um, we just have to, to, to make it important in, in these courses that we develop. Um, sorry, Jake, please, please go on. <laughs> You're muted, Jake. All right. Uh, speaking about Corbett in a, in a PME uh, uh, context, I, I'm involved a lot in, in officer education, and, and, and there's so many things um, to, for them to do and to read. Uh, and you uh, basically, uh, it, it's very rare that you, you get the time uh, to... to uh, to really throw Corbett at them in, in the original text. I mean, it, it's usually broader uh, uh, approaches to naval or uh, maritime strategy that you have time with. Uh, uh, we do a lot of naval tactics, naval operations. Uh, but I, um, uh, I, I, have, I have noticed that he, he is still very popular uh, among the students. And when you have the time, to insert some of his texts uh, or or books uh, about him, uh, it's um, it's it's worth their time and and they appreciate it a lot. Uh, speaking about Corbett and um, you know, to my mind, he's the greatest maritime thinker. But I, I um, in my book, I I wrote a few things. I, I think it was ten. Uh, things that I thought that, you know, you could improve upon if you would write a, a similar book today. And uh, it's, it's one obvious one. It, it's very, from a very British perspective uh, and, and a great power perspective. And I think Andrew shows that excellently in, in his book. Uh, and you might consider how relevant is he for other other countries. I think there's a lot of relevance, uh, but it's it's a very British perspective when 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 you read his books on principles. Also, the great power uh, perspective. Uh, most powers are not great powers; they're small, medium uh, powers, and they're not Iceland uh, countries uh, or nations like, like Britain. Uh, and, and that also um, affects uh, uh, the way you would write, I think, a, a book on, on maritime strategy coming from other countries and from other, other settings. Um, and um, of course, I think also Andrew mentioned that he, he thinks Corbett is a great interpreter of Clausewitz, and I agree, but it's also a um, fairly unique and special uh, interpretation of Clausewitz. It's very like rationalistic, very instrumental. Um, it's, it's a pretty neat and tidy picture of, about how war uh, is, is constructed and, and how war works. Uh, and we all know it's a pretty brutish and chaotic affair. Uh, and that strikes me sometimes when I read Corbett that he uh, uh, paint this picture of a pretty neat and tidy uh, uh, thing. And, um, and, and, and I think if you would write and try to improve on his work, I think you can go in the direction of Clausewitz a little bit more, uh, and 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 try to avoid that that neatness and that instrumentality that that he's using, because because um, war is a bit more complex sometimes, uh, and you know all the moral elements and everything like that, and you don't see much of that in in Corbett. It makes him easier to read, I think, and 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 uh, interpret. But it also sort of sometimes lacks a little bit of how our real wars are. Uh, thank you. I can see Andrew frantically unmuting. <laughs>
did you want to pop in on that, Andrew? Okay, so nope, I'm happy. Carry on. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I think I, I think it's really interesting, actually, Jake, on that point to, to see how Corbett tries to make that fit in the in the three volumes that he wrote of the official history, which is sort of tantalisingly, obviously, um, the last volume which may have answered some of these questions to a degree is sort of not there but uh, i suppose my reading of those and i'll admit i haven't read the three volumes um in the last couple of years the last time i read them i think i was probably doing my phd but that it does feel like there's almost a little bit of a tension between trying to reconcile what has happened with some of the more elegant footwork in the theory that's done in done in some principles because it, it's almost like um accounting for the disappointment of 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 people not having lived up to some of the expectation that it's kind of theoretically possible to justify so you know i wonder if a close reading of those books may have some kind of help in that regard but pushing us towards this more sort of contemporary angle then we had uh, a question come in, in in the chat which is about kind of corbett in a contemporary context so you know engaging with using corbett today um and the question sort of mentioned South China Sea and, and China. Now, we've sort of talked about how Corbett provides you with ways to interrogate problems rather than, than answers to them. But I sort of invite any of you to remark on kind of what your thoughts are on the contemporary salience of Corbett. And I suppose how you view Corbett to be relevant. So I think we, we talk quite interestingly about how Corbett has probably got an awful lot to offer in terms of one's developing one's own thinking uh, by engaging with the times that he lived in, some of, the, some of the really elegant and incisive prose that he came up with and some of the ideas that he put across. But um, when we're thinking about Corbett's relevance, can we go beyond that? And are there aspects, frames of it that can potentially be considered more in a, in a more applied context. I'd invite any of you to kind of offer some remarks on that. Uh, yeah, ha happy to have to look at that. Um, it's critical to remember Corbett's extensive writing on international law, uh, not just his pre-war writing on belligerent rights, but also his very effective work as a propagandist during the war in defending the British model of economic warfare against attacks first by the Germans uh, and then increasingly by Woodrow Wilson and the, the Democratic government, uh, Democratic Party government in Washington. It's no accident that Corbett's last two propaganda essays were printed in New York rather than in London. Uh, they were entirely aimed at American audiences and Interestingly, when Woodrow Wilson gave up point two of his 14 points, absolute freedom of the seas in wartime, he quoted Corbett. I, I think he did it unwittingly. I can't imagine he would have done it deliberately, but he uses Corbett's phrase uh, to explain what he's done. So maintaining an international legal regime, which is amenable to the use of maritime power and gives it leverage against a very large continental power, is what Corbett is all about. Uh, the British need to defend the, the right to conduct economic warfare. That explains the, the peace processes in 1814-15, the peace with America and the peace with the rest of Europe. They're driven by Britain's need to preserve the primary weapon system, which is economic warfare. And that's why they sacrifice many of their colonial conquests um, and go for a, a peace of ascension of status quo ante with the United States. Um, as far as they're concerned, preserving those rights is more important than territory. They're quite happy to give the Americans back half of Maine and to give the Dutch back the whole of um, what is now Indonesia because the prize is maintaining the right to, to conduct proper maritime strategy. That's, the, that's the, the critical thing. So that's what Corbett is developing. And when he's talking about the Seven Years' War, and Anna knows this better than anyone, um, the, the individual who really matters in all of this is Lord Hardwick. It, it's getting the legal precedents settled. And it's the legal development of those arguments that Corbett is, is tying into the strategic development. So strategy and law have to come in hand in hand. If you're developing a strategy that relies on international legal 
precedent, you have to make sure you've got all of your ducks lined up and that the legal argument is not going to let down your political argument. Uh, in the First World War, the British exploit not just their own legal position, but in the case of the blockade, they also use French economic warfare law because that's different and actually can be, in some cases, more applicable uh, to blockade operations. So the 10th Cruiser Squadron always includes a French warship. It's actually a British warship with a few Frenchmen on it, uh, given a French name. But this ship can arrest blockade breakers, which British ships cannot arrest uh, because of the legal situation. So Corbett sees all of that. And the great problem with naval operations, I, I thought Dave raised, raised a very good point there, and that's the, the, the open reading argument uh, that I want to raise. What is Corbett going to say at the end of naval operations? How is he going to round this up? What is the end of Corbett's version? It's, it's no good reading what Henry Newbold writes because that that he didn't actually write that. It was written by Corbett's staff. Um, Corbett is imposing order and coherence and strategic logic on operational narratives. Henry Newbold just publishes what he's given. So the last two volumes are effectively useless because Corbett is writing a textbook for post-war PME. Naval operations is going to be the, the central plank of post-war naval education. It will replace the Seven Years' War and the campaign of Trafalgar and the Russo-Japanese War because this is the new experience. This is the latest material. And we're going to have Britain's best maritime strategist explaining and developing these arguments for that audience of post-1919 naval officers going back into the Staff College and developing thinking for the future. He gets to do this once. And it's the opening chapters of volume one that he's he's lecturing because that's already available. So I think that's critically important. And I think understanding that volume one of naval operations is the basis of Lord Jellicoe's post-war empire mission. Jellicoe and Corbett are very close. Jellicoe refuses to set off on his global tour to un understand the strategic needs of, of the British empire without naval operations volume one which he gets advanced two advanced copies for himself and his chief of staff. Jellicoe's report reads like Corbett wrote it. There's a very clear synergy there. They'd known each other for a long time and, and had worked together on a number of issues. So he's shaping the way people are thinking strategically right up to the top. And even in his very last months when he's trying to finish volume three of naval operations. He's also writing a position paper for Herbert Richmond at the Admiralty on the strategic utility of the Panama Canal in the event of an Anglo-American war. So he's right up to date. He's always thinking about the here and now and the past always subordinated to the present. So he is a historian for the present. His audience is looking ahead. And I think if, you know, if we're looking at the current context, we're looking at relations between a maritime coalition and a Chinese continental power, which is anxious to exert greater control over the maritime domain. Uh, Corbett would be stressing the legal basis of the maritime case, and he would be emphasizing the need to reinforce that and to make sure that you've, you're creating a legal environment in which the strategic advantages of maritime power can be exploited rather than allowing a power like China to shape the legal regime in ways that are not helpful and are in fact advantageous to continental powers. Not letting um, a continental power like China essentially extend its land boundaries out into deep blue sea and, and call it liquid territory is a critical part. And that's what you need to do in terms of shaping the strategic context. You need to win those legal arguments as well as thinking about the technology the communications and all the other aspects. The legal arguments are critical. And that's one of the things where Corbett is right at the top of the strategic analysts uh, of the past and, and is a great model for the future because he sees that front and center right the way through. Uh, he's acutely aware of the legal issues. Even when he's writing about Francis Drake, he's very keen to emphasize the legal basis on which it was possible for Tudor privateers to operate in the Caribbean as opposed to the Mediterranean. So he's doing that over and over again. And if you study war without studying the law, you're going to come unstuck. 
and in the 21st century you'll probably end up in a court and be arraigned for breaking the rules uh, rather than for more conventional failings from the past so being legally astute critical and i think corbett gives us a window into that and he emphasizes just how important the law was in the evolution of british strategy and you know that's somewhere something where anna's work has been really important no i, th I think andrew that you're, you're entirely correct about this and i would i would just add as well that along with the the, the emphasis on the legal side you know part of the reason that Corbett understands and does emphasize the legal aspect of strategic thinking um, is, is tied to questions of legitimacy. And, and this becomes very clear when you are looking at what is happening with China and, and the attempt to, to take over this, this idea of liquid territory and to push the boundaries of, of accepted legal maritime norms. Um, you know, you know, China is trying to to push an attempt to sort of redefine what these norms are in China's own interest. And this makes perfect sense. Of course, China would do this. Why wouldn't China do this? This is what the United States has done. This is what Britain has done. You know, this is part of, of using the law and the maritime sphere as a national strategy. I think it would also be perhaps remiss of us almost to, to not mention, you know, the Corbettian phrase, control of communications. Right. I mean, if, if you want an enduring Corbettian almost maxim, although he hated maxims, so perhaps I shouldn't say that. And um, this idea of control of communications is key. You know, if if you want to continue to have access to trade, if you want to continue to have a, a liberal world order with sort of capitalism and free trade at its heart, then you have to have control of communications. And if you lose that or if you cede that to another power or another group of powers, then you are going to start to lose the edge that that gives you. So I would say that the control of communications really, along with the legal side, absolutely remains one of Corbett's most enduring contributions to how we conceive of maritime strategy and, and national strategic thinking. Did you want to jump in on this, Jack? I think uh, Corbett's uh, strategy, American strategy, will be increasingly uh, relevant, uh, especially for, for countries, liberal democracies, uh, depending on, on uh, trade uh, and uh, and for example, United States uh, or some some big countries that I, I I've read doctrines, and they're usually they usually tend to sort of be attracted to to Mahan uh, and his uh, ideas. And I think if you are a liberal democracy, a status quo power that you don't uh, you know you you don't want to in, get into wars. And you're you're faced with countries that that wants to sort of expand and change the world order. I think uh, Corbett's maritime strategy uh, will be uh, uh, very important for the uh, United States today, for example, Japan, uh, uh, the EU, uh, and and having read uh, we we do that in, in in the Swedish Defense University and and the, and the, with the military officers we read a lot of doctrines from other countries and uh, and I'm struck by how some uh, especially um, you know, great powers uh, that wants to sort of expand and and become more prominent uh, like Russia. China, uh, India, uh, that they are much focused on, on Mahan's thinking uh, and very influenced by, by, by them. And, and the way to counter that is, is probably to view it or, or approach it uh, the way Corbett approached uh, uh, things during his time when, when, he, when his country were facing uh, France, uh, of tensions with France and then the the German uh, Empire that was trying to expand. Uh, so so I, I see some parallels there 
uh, and connected to, to China, for example, uh, for the United States to keep that balance with all the, the, their allies and, and to keep the com communications at sea uh, open and, and, and uh, yes. Yeah, I, th I absolutely agree with that. Of course, when Mahan is writing, the United States is not really a great power. It doesn't have a navy. It's it's only just beginning to to launch out of the continental phase into the the global phase, and so Mahan reads very well. If you're planning to go from being a continental power to being a, a great power and to reach out to the sea, uh, which is why he translates superbly into German in the 1890s. Um, the Kaiser sees this immediately. Uh, and so does Tirpitz. Uh, so they're talking about different things. What we're looking at today is there's a Western liberal economic consortium that effectively has a Corbettian strategy collectively. Um, we see the the uh, AUKUS deal with uh, the British, Australians and, uh, and Americans uh, linking up more closely. We saw the, the carrier strike group from Britain sail into the South China Sea. Uh, we saw a, a legal demonstration uh, steaming past uh, non-islands, which the Chinese think of as territory, and of course, uh, transiting the Taiwan Straits, which the Chinese claim as territorial waters. So that's all part of that process, challenging illegal activity, challenging attempts to limit the use of maritime power uh, and to continentalize the strategic environment uh, to an even greater extent. Uh, than has been the case up to now. So instead of thinking about weaponizing the sea, we need to think about making sure we can still use it um, and are emphasized the communications. That's what sea power is, it's control of communications, it's the ability to use the sea and to deny it to the other side. That's not a symmetrical contest. This isn't two European great powers fighting a, a battle somewhere on either side of the Rhine. This isn't France and Germany squaring up in a land battle. These are powers which are asymmetric and therefore, from the sea, you have to think about maximizing that advantage, because it's highly likely that in other areas you may not have that advantage. Britain's strategic experience is important because it never had a big army until late in the First World War, and it invariably came up against powers with much bigger armies, and it had to think of ways of waging war effectively against hegemonic continental states which had different political, economic, and military systems. And so where Clausewitz is talking about like states fighting in a conventional way, Corbett is talking about unlike states. Uh, and constantly, one of the themes of his work is, here is Britain, which is not doing what everybody else is doing, because it's not like everybody else. It's offshore, it's insular, it's maritime, and increasingly global. And so he's writing a strategic doctrine which fits closer to the, the Western liberal consortium of the 21st century than that of pretty much all the other strategic writers. You know, his politics line up, his, I think his ideas line up. Uh, and if we need a, a doctrinal starting point for discussions of how we need to think about the 21st century from a British liberal Western position, that is the best place to start. It's not the end of the debate, but it's certainly a very good place to start. And to understand that the, the threats he's facing going into 1914 are of a hegemonic European power, which will close down economic access. You know, what is the controlling the sea about? It's about denying access. You know, what is China's agenda in the South China Sea? To stop people coming in there, to make sure that they can't have their resources cut off and to be able to deny market access uh, to hostile powers. So. Continental imperial powers build hegemonic empires and close down economic activity. Uh, they are a threat to the economic livelihood of liberal progressive states, and that's the fracture line. The 19th century, every single country that Britain ends up fighting is running highly restrictive economic approaches to the development of its internal economy. Um, and the powers that Britain ends up allying with are the ones that don't do that. You know, there's a link between trade and, and, and strategy and war, and it is that open trade uh, makes countries more engaged, and if you close trade down, you disengage. The Anglo-Russian standoffs of the long 19th century are all about trade. 
the British didn't want the Russians to take over the Ottoman Empire because they would have shut the marketplace and run it for themselves. They would have closed down that very big marketplace that the British were then operating in. The Crimean War is about money. It's not about the Crimea. I think those points about um, about communications and about access also sort of highlight some of the ways that if you think about Corbett a bit more flexibly, you can kind of see aspects of kind of the endeavour that he was engaged in as relevant, even if some of the things that he um, wrote about might have changed or the things that he didn't write about. So if you think about it in terms of Corbett's writing a book about maritime strategy, because it's all international um, intercourse that is not over a land border or by a railway happens in the maritime domain at the point at which he's writing. Now, obviously, a vastly significant amount of it still does, but there are lots of other considerable forms of global flows and exchange. And if there was a, if we would reanimate Corbett and Corbett was alive uh, and updating some principles of maritime strategy today, it might end up being called some principle, some principles of, of something else strategy, as it were, because there would be considerations of finance, national infrastructure, investment, um, cybersecurity, or, you know, all of those sorts of other areas, because that's the, the, the way that the world works and political economy is an absolutely foundational kind of part of, of, of yep. all of this. Yeah, I think that it's important to remember that Corbett's wealth came from international investments. Uh, in the back of his diaries, there are the dividend certificates of some of the companies in which he was invested. And they, a lot of them are in North America, in Europe. Um, uh, his his brother, who who was also an MP, is running a major city finance house. Um, so some somebody has once claimed that Corbett didn't understand global finance. He absolutely he lived on it, um, and his brother was one of the country's leading experts. So I think that that's a non sequitur. So Corbett does understand this. I think he probably underrepresents it in his writing. Uh, I think. You know, having looked at where the money's coming from that's, that's subsidizing what he's doing, it becomes very clear that he does understand how the world works financially, and he is very aware of that. I think more so than uniformed uh, writers on strategy who, t who tend to assume that these things are a given. I think Corbett understands they're most certainly not a given. Um, he also understands that governments are reluctant to spend money on defense because he's a liberal, and the liberals have a long history of not spending on defense. Okay, fantastic. So I'm conscious that we've trespassed slightly past um, the hour, and that given it is uh, a Friday evening, um, we've been very lucky to have uh, all of our panellists for as long as we have already had them. So um, I'm sure that you'll all join me in giving a, a, a virtual thanks, round of applause, crappy emoji, if you would like to add one to uh, Anna, to, to Jake and to Andrew, and to say Thank you very much indeed for some really interesting reflections. Um, this session has been recorded, so it will be available afterwards if any colleagues or students uh, wanted to access it that weren't able to, to dial in today. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything else about kind of the future of the, the series, Anna, but I believe this is going to be a, a sort of ongoing endeavour. Did you have a sense when there might be a, a follow up that people could tune into? Yeah, so we're, we're looking to run it sort of every six months. Um, and I believe the next one will actually be on Sir Herbert Richmond. Um, and in fact, Dave, I believe you are on that panel. Um, so you, you will see Dave again when we, when we tune in for that one. Um, we, will, we will put this up on the Corbett Center YouTube channel. And if you do follow us on Twitter, you'll see an announcement there of when it's up and running. And we hope to see all of you guys again. Thank you so much. For coming it's it's really lovely to talk about this stuff and and to know that there are other people interested in these topics and who who enjoy waxing lyrical about ideas um, presented by men such as corbett so thank you all so much and hopefully we will see you again soon and thank you again to, to dave for chairing this so wonderfully and to andrew and to jake for for agreeing to talk it was really really lovely to to chat with you guys about corbett so thank that's you been, that's been tremendous thank you anna thank you dave great to see you again jake and um have a have a good weekend everyone um thanks thanks very much you too thanks for inviting me and have a great weekend uh, yep thanks jake talk to you all soon <laughs>